Hey, how y'all doing? This is OXDF, and the goal today is I'm looking at a relatively easy box from Hack the Box Late. And, um, you know, it's something I used to do a lot when I was first getting started, um, is just going through and understanding how the web server is set up. And I thought it might be useful to go through and do a quick uh, run through from Nginx to G Unicorn to Python Flask and just see how the app is running, how it's all connected together, um, and make sure we understand that. So. Uh, with that, would you know, just you know, it's it is the late box from Hack the Box, but it's really this could be any web server up until the very end when we get into the specific Python code, um, and really it's just you know how is how does Nginx configure things? How does that tie to the G Unicorn uh, program? How is it running the Python Flask app, um, and everything in between? So uh, hopefully it's kind of a interesting tour, and I would encourage you to do this kind of thing every time you solve a box. Um, because no matter what level you are, I'm going to try to keep this at a relatively beginner level. But, um, you know, even for more advanced people, there's always things you can find looking at how things are configured and how things are set up that maybe you didn't know. Um, and if you don't, if it doesn't make sense to you, play with it, change it, your root, right? Like make, mess with, you know, take down the web server and run GeoCorn manually, just manually to see what it looks like. Um, we do that in this video. So uh, with that, we will go ahead and dive in. So I'm starting here with a root SSH shell on the late box from Hack the Box. Um, but this video is not going to be focused on, for the most part, specifically this web app. Um, but we will we do come in knowing that we have an Nginx uh, web server hosting here and that there's some kind of Python application behind it. So a good place to start whenever you're looking at how a web server is configured is coming into Etsy uh, Nginx. If it's an Apache server, you can come to Etsy Apache. Um, and specifically, we're going to look in the uh, sites enabled folder. And we see just one site here. Um, it's worth knowing that typically this is done through a sim link into a, you know, having a sim link in sites enabled that points to something in sites available. Um, if we look in sites available here, um, there's actually just the one still. But what this does is it allows an admin to set up multiple websites, multi di multiple different configurations, and then just keep all of those in sites in available. And then when you want to enable one, you just create the sim link and it's there. Um, so with that, we will uh, say vim sites enable this we could do either of them default and so this is a pretty standard looking configuration here um, there's two servers defined so we have the server defined here and a server defined here um, for each of them so for this one we're going to listen on 80 uh, this one's also listening on 80 um, and this one is has you'll see it's defined as the default server so this is the one it's going to pick if it doesn't have a reason to pick something else um, you'll come down here and see server name. This is late.hackthebox. Server name down here is images.late.hackthebox. So effectively what that's saying is if the host header is images.late.hackthebox, follow this stuff. Otherwise, because it's default, it's following this one, top one. Um, so the top one here, root, is going to give us the directory from which files are served. Um, it's going to specify some index files to look for. Um, so in this case, you know, if you visit just slash on late.hackthebox, uh, it's going to check and it's going to say, is there an index file? Is there an index.html file? Is there an index.htm file? Is there an index.nginx-debian.html file? And if it finds any of those, it'll return it and stop. Um, otherwise, then it can 404. Um, but that's a, this is a pretty simple static web server. There's nothing, nothing fancy going on here. Um, if we come down here, uh, the second one here is basically for the location uh, slash, which is going to be anything, anything starting with slash. Um, it's going to include the params and it's going to pass it on to 127.001.8000. So we are looking for what's running on 127.001.8000. So what's running there? Uh, let's, let's do a netstat TNLP and see that 8000, this line right here, is a Python 3. We got the process ID right here, so we can do a PS AUX dub dub grep. 3250. I'm sure there's a way to specify the PID you want, uh, but I just graphing is a lot easier for me because I remember it. Um, and so we can see right here, this is running off of G Unicorn. Um, and it has got three workers and it's got the WSGI uh, app parameter here. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and find, um, we can go into st staying in the Etsy directory. Um, this is probably running as a service. So let's go in, uh, it would be in systemd and then typically in system, in fact, let's go up one and we can do a grep uh, minus R for recursive. And then we can just do, let's just grab G unicorn and here. And we find right away that there's a, there's a, in the system folder, there's a web app.service file. 
and the exec start calls that. So let's go ahead and vim system web app service. So this is defining a service on Linux. And what it's doing here, it's got some description, descriptive stuff here about when it's gonna come up, what the name is, um, who it's running as. So if, if you've solved this box, you'll know that you get a shell running as SVC ACC, um, the working directory that it's running out of, and then what runs to start. So this is again, pretty simple. Um, so we're gonna now wanna go over here, grab that and uh, we will CV to that. And so here we have, we're in the app folder and we've got, um, if you remember here, here's, we got WSGI and app. Um, and so let's take a quick second and uh, we can go to GUnicorn. So let's, let's find some GUnicorn here and see what we got. Um, if you look under the quick start, we can see right real quickly, it's got a, uh, this myapp.py and it returns some data. And so this is the file it's in and this is the, uh, this is the app object or function. Um, if we go, let's see, I think there's another. If we go to the, uh, I thought, let's see, where's the documentation? Let's see, it says for more information, documentation, let's go look that up. Uh, running G Unicorn. I don't know if this is big enough to read, but it, it, what we're passing to it is some options and then a WSGI app where WSGI app is of the pattern module name, variable name. The module can be a full dotted path. The variable refers to a WSGI callable that should be specified in the module. Um, we don't need to know right now exactly what a WS, WSGI callable is, um, but it's fair to say, we saw that one example in the docs um, on the other page or here, right here, this app thing is a WSGI callable. WSGI call. Um, also things like a flask, anything, any framework. Um, so if we look up uh, Python flask, I'm kind of going off, off where I plan to go here, but we'll look at it. Um, does it say anything about WSGI in here? Yeah, so it depends on Jinja and the WSGI, WSGI toolkit. Um, so it flask is going to build us a WSGI application. And so we can pass it that as well. Um, so if we go, if we look in here, uh, we'll see this WSGI that's our module we're calling. And then it's calling, it's actually referencing the app. Now, interestingly, app is actually just imported from main right here. And then there's this if name equals main, blah, blah, blah. In Python, you're gonna see this. What if name equals main means is when you run something, when I do Python space and then a Python file, the name of that, the, the, the underscore underscore or what we say is dunder name variable is going to be main if that's the main thing called. Anything that's then loaded from elsewhere, like from an import statement and things like that, is not is going to have a different name, and so the name won't be main. So in this case, when when uh, G Unicorn is calling this, this stuff's actually none of this is actually happening. So this port fifty eight one six isn't isn't going to get this that line's not going to get hit at all. The only thing this is really doing is importing the app from here. Um, so we can actually see this. Let's see, what was the, um, if I do a, let's see, we'll kill uh, this process right here. Web server's now down. Check netstat to verify. Uh, presumably I can check netstat to verify. Yeah, there we go. Uh, nothing else running on 8,000 anymore. And we can do a G unicorn, probably, yep. Uh, we don't need workers, so we'll just do WSGI app like that, I believe it was. And you can see right here, now it's running. Uh, it's found that app object, it's running, it's listening on port 8000. Um, I had a hard time, it's not in much, I couldn't find anywhere in the documentation that actually said that it listens on 8000 by default. Um, but you could, there are ways to specify the interface, um, the IP and the port that it listens on, but by default it looks like it does localhost 8000. Um, and so that's cool. I, I mentioned before that in the wisgi.py file, the only thing that it's uh, doing to create app is just importing it from main. So we can actually come over here and do uh, main app. We get the exact same thing. Um, we I could pull it up, but we, you get the same page. Um, and so that's kind of cool. I guess you don't, I'm not sure you really need this WSGI file, but that, that's fine. Um, let's see, we broke the web app service. Let's see, the service was called web something, web app, yep. We check status. Uh, we can confirm that it is exited. <laughs> okay, we it's dead. Uh, let's do restart, get it back and working. And there we go, now we're running, sweet. 
Okay, so the service is back. Um, that we just killed it to show that we could find, you know, A, where Fort 8000 was coming from, and B, um, that G how G Unicorn worked. Okay, so now here we are. Um, we've looked at whiskey.py. We can see it's really just importing from main.py. So I think it's time to look at main.py. Um, go up to the top here. Standard anatomy of a flask app. Uh, you're going to see it's going to start almost always. There might be some more configuration that takes place somewhere, but in general, uh, we're going to start with a call to capital flask, and we're going to generate, and you could call this variable whatever you want, but it's very typical to call it app. Um, and then once you do that, you get access to all these sorts of other things. So for example, these are decorators. And if you're not um, super steeped in Python, the idea of a decorator might be kind of confusing, but think of it as just a wrapper around a function to make it to, to give some standard functionality to it. In this case, um, I've never actually looked at the source code, but I'm going to assume the wrapper around home, for example, is going into the Flask application and registering the fact that when someone visits the slash directory, that web server now knows it needs to call the home function because of this wrapper. Um, and that's and that's how you build a Flask app, is you give different the different app routes you want to have, you just decorate them. You create functions and you decorate them, and then you return what you want to return. Um, so the home, the home path or function uh, is just going to return rendering template uh, index.html. Um, we can visit this. Let's see. Uh, it hits images.late.hexbox. Of course. Thank you, Google. Images.late.hgbp in front of that. Sweet. Um, so this, it's pretty simple. You know, we don't need, this doesn't change. It's going to be the same every time. So all we're going to do when you visit here is just get this template HTML file and return it. Um, it could have even returned it as a static file, probably, because there's no template actually being rendered. There's nothing rendered into the template. Um, but the render template function does give you the ability to pass variables in. So uh, this index.html file could have places in it where you put um, squiggly, squiggly brackets and call it on some other variable, and you would pass it in. Oh, in fact, it does. Uh, it's going to have a title here, and that title is passed in. Now, in this case, you don't need that because you could just pass the title. The title could just be static, because but larger applications, you might want to have different, you might have a, uh, some sort of base template where you still want to pass the title in. So you do it this way. Um, and then the rest of this comes down to, uh, you know, this scan file thing. So this takes both a git and a post. Um, I'm a little surprised it takes a git. I'm not sure what it would do with a git, but, um, oh, in fact, if, if we look down here, the first one of the first things it does is check if it's a post and otherwise it does nothing. So I, I'm not sure why the author didn't just make this take post as a method, but Sure, we'll we'll go with it. Um, so it starts with these declaring these variables. Um, this is now we're getting into a little bit the late specific stuff. Um, I remember ch we if you read my blog post, you'll or if you solved it yourself, you might have checked for command injection here, thinking that perhaps they were calling um, an OCR program like Tesseract. Um, it looks like they're doing a bunch of things here to try to make sure you can't do that, and I was unsuccessful at command injecting here. Um, for example, they are generating a random ID. Um, they are generating a file name in the upload directory with this with the file name that's passed in this f dot file name which comes from here um, they're appending the random ID so that's not guessable um, but they're also passing it to this secure file name function and if we look up here uh, that's imported right here from the words well, say that rec zerg utils uh, we can come over here and look at what that is um, secure file name. And your file. so right here, uh, pass it a file name and it'll return a secure version of it. It can be safely stored on a regular file system and passed to ospath.join. Uh, so you can see here it removes um, the flashes. And I actually don't know. I wonder if I, I don't think I'm even in Tmux here. Uh, let's do terminal. Can I do? How do I get myself a new tab? Okay, open tab. Uh, video. Sweet. Let's do Python. Going, again, we're going a little off script here, but let's see. Uh, from, do I still have it? Yep. Import secure file name. So let's, let's look and see what that does, right? Um, so let's say we do secure file name of abcd.txt. Turns abc.txt. Uh, let's see if we start. So it showed us on the example that we try to do some sort of directory traversal. It cleans that up. Um, we can assume it's done safely, so I can't do like something like like these kinds of tricks where it you know removes recursively yeah it still cleans up nicely um we'll see what about something like command injection like that just it, so you can see it just removed the, the back ticks um or here if i try to do um 
something like that. It removes this thing. So, so that's where my command injection got thwarted. Um, it did not work because secure file name was stripping anything interesting I might have been trying to do to it out of it. So um, that didn't work. Um, they're also using, interestingly, I had found um, Tesseract as a possible uh, executable that was being called. And I would have guessed it was probably being called a subprocess, but uh, it seems there's a pi Tesseract. Um, interestingly, you still have to pass it the Tesseract binary. So it seems like this is probably some kind of wrapper around you, you have to put the Tesseract binary there, but it's more um, probably a more safe way than just using subprocess um, to call Tesseract. And so, so we pass the image into, we use pill to open the image, uh, pass it into PyTesseract, get back scan text. Um, and here's the, you know, so what we found in this box is a uh, server side template injection. Anytime you see render template from render template string, you, you want like alarm bells to going off because that is a um, dangerous function. And you never want to say never. There are lots of weird edge cases out there, but you really, it's not, there's no good reason. There's very few good reasons why you'd want to use this. Um, so maybe that's not true, but I, it's, it, whenever you see, especially in a CTF, you're going to want to go to that and figure out how you can get your input in there. Um, because what's, what it allows for is you look at this like results right here. Uh, if I'm able to pass scan text in with, with, the template link, templating language here, um, then I'll be able to get that executed within Python when it renders. Um, what could we possibly have done here? Um, you know, they're actually writing, they actually are saving it, this right here. You could have just returned this, right? Return results. There was no need to render it at all. Um, and it would have been fine. Um, or they, they could have, I don't know exactly know why they're writing it to a file and then sending the file back. But again, even if they wanted to do that, they, they could just skip this R step entirely and just replace R with results and it would have worked great. So, but again, these are real vulnerabilities and they do show up very often. So they're certainly worth knowing about. Um, with that, that was kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, a web server and how, you know, whenever I go beyond root, how I like to dig into it and see if I can understand what's happening. Um, the first time I ever did this, I didn't know any of this. And, um, it was really valuable, but I would have to go in, I'd say Nginx, how do I configure Nginx? And I would have to Google it and then find, oh, go look in Sites Enabled. And I look at it and, you know, it looks kind of like, uh, what does this mean? And so you spend some time Googling that stuff. This is this is the cool part about, you know, when you finish a Hack the Box box, uh, when you finish a CTF box, go understand how it works and go understand how it works, uh, how it's functioning and how it's configured. And uh, it will pay benefits, you'll, you'll learn. There's a ton more learning you can get um, and you just finished understanding it from the attacker's point of view. So go understand it from the defender's point of view, from the, the IT point of view. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and call it here. Um, thanks for sticking with me, and I uh, will talk to you next time.